This is Ahwal Online, meeting point of accurate news and free comment on the current affairs of Turkey. Welcome to our podcast series. Hello and welcome to Talking Turkey. I'm your host, Aval editor David Lepeska, and with me today is Nurjan Baysal, Diyarbakir-based Kurdish journalist, Aval columnist, and 2018 Global Laureate for Human Rights Defenders at Risk, according to the Irish NGO Frontline Defenders. Hello, Nurjan, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello, David. It's a pleasure. Uh, we are speaking on Monday, April 6th. It's nearly four weeks since Turkey announced its first coronavirus infection. Uh, Turkey now has more than 27,000 cases, ninth most in the world, with more than 570 deaths. You live in Diyarbakir, the largest city in Turkey's southeast and the de facto capital of the majority Kurdish region down there. Uh, you've been writing about the local coronavirus response which last week got you into a bit of trouble. Uh, please, yeah. if you could tell us what happened. Did they did they raid your home like last time? How did it start? Yeah, just uh, last week, uh, six days ago, uh, the police called me and they want me to come to the police station. And they said that there's a criminal investigation opened against me because of my uh, last uh, articles in on Afghan news about the coronavirus measures in my city and in other Kurdish cities. And then I went and then they told me that there's an arrest warrant for me <laughs> because of these articles and some of my social media posts. They are mostly also about the coronavirus measures in Kurdish cities. Did they and mention a specific crime? Yeah, they, they said that, you know, they the specific crime, they said that with, with these articles and uh, with this uh, social media post, they, they are mainly tweets. I provoked the public to hatred and hostility. Uh huh. Okay. And okay. In my articles, uh, maybe you read the article. The yeah. article is just telling about the coronavirus measures in my city, uh, in my homeland, the Arbaker. So it, it was a bit funny. And then they said that because of coronavirus risk, I can go to home tonight, but tomorrow I need to come again because uh, uh, as there's a detention, you know, uh, decision about me. I was really shocked. And the other day I went with two lawyers and then, you know, the, all, you know, all these detention processes, uh, they took me to, to hospital, <laughs> to uh, prosecutor and then to judge. And so it's a long process. And then uh, they told me that with these articles and social media posts, uh, my social media posts are a threat to incitement to fear and panic among the public. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? It's really so funny. And then, you know, I, I told that, you know, I'm a journalist and human rights defender, and it's my right to inform the public about the measures taken in my city about the, against the coronavirus pandemic. And then I'm, I am released for now, but because if indicted, then I may be charged with provoking the public to hatred and hostility. So we don't know for now what will happen. So you're still waiting to hear if there are official charges? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, I'm waiting. Okay, yeah. Okay, follow, yeah, following that ordeal last week, you wrote a piece for Aval detailing your fears. Uh, you said you'd been writing, then deleting tweets and feeling very uncertain about how far you could now go in terms of pushing the government when your sons need you at home right now. So yeah. are you still feeling that way? Does that fear ever go away? Yeah, yeah, I still, you know, I still sometimes after I tweet, I erase my tweets again. <laughs> I clean them because, you know, it is, you know, we are all under the risk of coronavirus and I don't want to be in prison when we have this risk, you know. And uh, I think this is what they want to do, and partly they are partly they are successful, partly. Uh, but I think many, many many people, many local journalists who are living here, we you know feel the same because we are more uh, you know they know our address. We are living in small cities. It is uh, more easier to reach our houses and many things like that. So maybe, you know, uh, in the last years, I, I had a few times home raids and they were, they violently, you know, entered my home. So we are always living with this risk. But now there's also one more risk and it is the coronavirus risk in prisons. And when I was interrogated by the uh, prosecutor, 
prosecutor mainly asked me about the uh, about uh, one paragraph in my uh, article on Ahvar News. Uh, he said that why I wrote about the prisons, the coronavirus risk in prisons. So they are. Uh, it, it seems that you know they are very sensitive about the uh, coronavirus and prisons. You know all this. Thing. It's interesting that he mentioned that because so many people have written about that. Yeah, and also he he told he asked me that why I use because maybe you remember last week there was a hashtag about the prisons. You know, yeah, Just, yeah. Uh, yeah, free, uh, empty, uh, empty, uh, make empty the prison, something like that. And he told me that, he asked me why I use that hashtag. Because I said, you know, it is the hashtag of that week. And, you know, like maybe 10 million people use it. And I asked the prosecutor why I am here. You know, there if 10 million people use it, but you are only taking me. And he said that you are not an ordinary person. You have an effect on people. And you should be more careful when writing things like that, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you, yeah. you you mentioned in that piece that in the past four years you've been detained three times, had your home raided twice, sentenced to ten months in prison, and and faced dozens of investigations. Yeah. Considering you have young children at home, the risk of moving about nowadays, in addition to the risk of arrest and jail, you ask in that piece how you can keep doing what you do, and 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 you admit that a crucial element is your links to major international organizations. You used to work for the United Nations Development Program, um, which provide you a protective shield, and you say that a lot of local journalists in Turkey and other countries don't have these kind of connections and they suffer more as a result. And then at the end of the column, you kind of urge these international organizations to do more, to reach out to and support these local journalists and build solidarity networks. I wonder if you could go into that a bit more. What, what do you think they could do? What might they do to help these local journalists like uh, those in Turkey? In the thing is that I'm, uh, David, I'm really out because of this international support and solidarity. And yeah. I, I I, I, I know it, but many local journalists, they don't have the same chance as me because many years, because of I'm working on human rights, I'm doing human rights advocacy and working for a long, long years on human rights uh, area. Many people, many international uh, institutions, they know about me, but lots of local journalists, they don't have that size. And so it is important. And many, many times the international institutions expect from the local people to apply to them. But in, when you live here, you don't have time. You don't have time to apply. You don't have those, you know, economic power to establish the institutions. You don't know the language. You know, you, you don't have many things. So because of this, I think it is important. It is also responsibility of the international institutions so dirty gurus try to reach the local people, you know, especially when we when we think about the, you know, Turkey, you know, at the end, you know, we, we are Kurdish, you know, we are far away also from the centers. And at the end, Turkey is a colonized society and we have hierarchies everywhere, even inside the institutions, even inside the angels. It is so hard, really, for someone from Jizre, from Nusaybin, from the Arbaker to uh, uh, reach not only reaching to Berlin, Paris, to other places. We can't even reach to Ankara and Istanbul many times. So mm -hmm. there should be, you know, uh, so people in the these big capitals they need to think about those people like us, you know, who are really li living in very remote areas. And uh, I, I think that's important because in my case, I really know that I'm out because of international solidarity. I'm, I'm just out because of that. Every time, because in like every three months, they are trying to take me with, with stupid things, really with stupid things, because they think that, you know, I, I, I have a power. Uh, my, you know, voice is uh, I have a powerful voice and uh, I can read, you know, take the information from the region to out to the West. And so because of that stupid things, every time they are trying to, you know, cut my voice. And because of international solidarity, every time I am out. But, you know, many people are in prison, like I wrote in my article, like Nedim Turpen, my friend. And he's in prison just because of, just because of one tweet. And four years nearly past he's in prison and he has more four years more and there are many people like this mm -hmm. and all these things are you know just they are 
closing all these things just with one word terrorism and we are all all these people are under the charge of terror you know uh, ter uh, supporting terror organization terror propaganda and everything like that you know you and are you, to, you, sorry so what is then you know to write a tweet to send a tweet to post a tweet to write an article like my article you, you know where, these are not things that you can put inside terrorism and now again we are because of this now now we have the coronavirus risk and they are you know they are passing a new law now this week and a, again they didn't uh, include the uh, political prisoners because they said that these all these political prisoners are in prison because of the terrorism terror charge but what is this terror charge you know we need to really open this word in terms what is terror what is terror charge the uh, sending a tweet posting a tweet writing an article or making a speech yeah yeah the government plans to reduce prison crowding and coronavirus risk by releasing up to a third of its prison population or about 90 90,000 people and as of now none of those convicted of terrorism will be among the released for most people around the world this might sound reasonable but turkey is a special case as uh, mayor selçuk mizrakla pointed out in his piece for aval just this week Quote, the government has conflated armed Kurdish groups with Kurdish politicians, organizers, and writers who have been striving for ethnic rights and representation for Turkey's largest minority group. It is in no way acceptable, he wrote, for the regime to choose those it sees fit to release while abandoning to death in prison journalists, students, lawyers, and intellectuals who are accused of thought crimes. The Council of Europe and Human Rights Watch have both also denounced the Turkish government's plan which Turkey's parliament is expected to vote on this week. Yeah, so what do you think about that? Uh, you know, the thing is that Turkish government, they are not listening, you know, they, they are not listening all these international institutions. Again, the international institutions, they have an effect in Turkey. I always say that it is it is important to continue to call, to make call to the Turkish government. But, uh, you know, in the last four or five years, now thousands of people are in prison just because of these terror charts, you know, lots of students. Even, you know, there are some Kurdish singers in prison because of just sing singing in Kur singing in Kurdish language, you know. And all pe uh, pe these people are in prisons because of terror charts. So I think it is so important, you know, to talk about really what is this terror charts and try to show to the public, you know, these people just they sang in uh, songs in Kurdish and because of this they are in prison or Nedim just posted a tweet and he's in prison because of this you know many people when you say the terror charge many people just stop you know to, to fight for the rights of these people so we need to open what is the, this all these terror charge I think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Diyarbakir is one of the 30 uh, Diyarbakir is one of the 31 cities the Turkish government has put on lockdown right yeah, uh, one of the 31 cities, Turkish government. Yeah, yeah the, the, the Turkish government has put 31 cities on lockdown, like barring all entry and exit except for essential travel. Is, is yeah, but is one of it's not so strict here, uh, David. It is, you know, and to, when you enter the city, at the entrances of the city, there are police uh, cars, you know, they are they are looking, but inside the city, there's no a uh, lockdown, you know. Mm. No, okay, so, yeah. in the... this. so on March 28, uh, just a little more than a week ago, you wrote for Aval that cafes, yeah. restaurants, and salons had closed across the Arbacher, but in some parts of the city, furniture shops, toy stores, and other retailers, other stores remained open, and that in Sur, the heart of the city, the streets were still relatively crowded, and half the businesses were open. Is it still like that today? No, today it, it is better. There are more strict measures. Uh, but again, still, when we look at special populated areas like Sur and Balar, there are you can see many people outside the, the, their homes. And the, most of these people, you, you know, also this social distancing is a kind, it's a luxury in some areas. You know, because all these people, you know, these are especially when we look to the Sur, for example, these people are mainly the people in Sur. They are gaining their bread daily, you know, with daily walks. And if they don't go out and if they don't work, there is no bread for that day. Mm. So if we don't support these people, you know, if we are, if, uh, if uh, we can't, if 
you know, if the state don't support them, you know, with food and other things, you know, these people will go out because they need to work. You know, people like me, we, we, we can stay at home, you know, a few more months, you know. Uh, so in the, in the area which I live, I live close to the uh, Urfa uh, road, we say it's an, another area, everywhere is closed here because it is more mid class. But then we go to the poor areas, you know, there are still uh, some shops are open. Mm. At the end of that piece, you visited the dairy behind your house and you told the yeah. worker getting your cheese that you wish he or she would wear gloves and a mask. An older man hears you and he tells you not to worry about that. After all we have seen, he asks, what's cor- what's coronavirus? You yeah. laughed at this, but, but but please tell us what that means. Please tell us how living in Diyarbakir, which was so recently the site of terrible violence and massive destruction, how it shapes locals' view of this outbreak. Yeah, also because uh, the city, you know, experienced many bad things in the last four or five years, especially in this, uh, in the 2015 and 2016, uh, when after the collapse of the peace process between the Kurdistan Workers Party and the Turkish state, uh, it was uh, on July 2015, uh, the clash has begun, but this time in the city centers. It's a characteristic that is different from the last 30 years, because in the last 30 years, we, we always had the war, but the war was practically the clashes were at the city, uh, were at the mountains, not in the city centers. But this time, the clashes were in the city centers. And then uh, the state, uh, the state declared military curfews. And during the military curfews, we witnessed terrible human rights violations and war crimes. So, you know, for example, in my city in Diyarbakir, I still remember, you know, there were dead bodies in the streets of Sur, and many times as human rights uh, activists, we try to enter the Sur area and to retrieve the dead bodies. So we saw, we saw, you know, this level of human rights violations, I mean. So me, this here, the people in Diyarbakir, uh, we had between, between uh, December 2015, and March 2016, a hundred days, this city was under the bombardment. So we, when we wake up, the bombardment uh, 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 continued. When we, uh, you know, uh, go to bed, still we had the bombardment. I remember my children when they came to uh, from the school. They sometimes they were telling me that, Mom, today I can't. They uh, used 50 bomb, you know, things like that. So mm-hmm. we. All these things, you know, after all these things, when you experience all these things, you know, people became more, how can I say, you know, their feelings like, you know, we saw many things, you know, and so they don't really give too much importance to this pandemic because they think that, you know, we saw many, many things, you know, after all, we have seen those uh, old men when I, uh, I was buying cheese last week told me that after all that we have seen. Coronavirus chie, it means what is coronavirus, you know? So we have also this kind of mood here in these cities. And we have some other reasons also why people are out. As I said, one thing is lots of people, especially in the poor areas, they need they need to work, you know? If you don't support them, they will go out and they, need, they will continue to work. But very, uh, there are some other important things also. For example, uh, when we look to Istanbul, the mayor of Istanbul, you know, co- they, they are talking to the people of Istanbul, you know, but when we look to our city, you know, our mayor, Selçuk Mızraklı, he's in prison. And, you know, we, we don't have, you know, our mayors, we don't have people who can really talk, speak out to on our behalf, you know, in this. Right, in right. You, you mentioned in the piece that Mizraklı yeah. is in prison and former HDP co-leader and presidential candidate Salahattin Demirtas is also in prison. So you don't have kind of two your main leaders. And then yeah. also the, the AKP government has repeatedly failed to deliver on its promises yeah. to the Kurdish people in Diyarbakir. So, you, so, so you're saying that kind of Kurdish people there just feel like they don't have their own leaders and they don't have any leadership at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's no trust also to this government, you know, because they made lots of promises, you know, in the last four years in the last four years, but they didn't realize their promises, you know. Uh, so they failed to follow through on their promises. So we have this trust problem with the government. But from other side, when we look at the Kurdish movement, you know, we don't, our own institutions are in this array. You know, there is no one that can speak out to, on our behalf in this city. And also all our institutions are so, you know, in the last years, they are 
uh, they are weakened, you know. You know, when we look the party, when we look to our NGOs, all our NGOs, for example, David, they were closed in the last four years. Uh, with the uh, emergency rule, I remember it was uh, September and November, especially two emergency rules, uh, laws, uh, September and November 2016, most of the NGOs were closed in this city, not only in Diyarbakir, in all over the Kurdish region, but mostly in Diyarbakir. So we don't have also are these NGOs. For example, I uh, one of the NGOs, I, I think I mentioned it in my article, uh, Sarmaşık. Yeah. Sarmaşık Association, it was, it was an association that deal uh, they were dealing with poverty, okay? And they had really very good solidarity campaigns, you know, uh, in fighting against the poverty. And they had a food bank. And with uh, uh, this food bank, they were every month, they were reaching 4,500 families, the poorest families in the Arbaker. Okay, and they closed Sarmashek. So today we don't have NGOs like this who really have real contacts, you know, on the field with the people of with Kurdish people. They are all closed. So all these things, when they come together, you know, so uh, you, it is sometimes normal to see people outside. And these NGOs were often helping the, the, the most poor and the most at risk now. And so now yeah. they're not being helped anymore. I saw on Twitter today that you highlighted the Diyarbakir Solidarity Network, which I guess is doing what? Filling some of the gaps left by these organizations that have been shut down by the government? Well, what are they doing? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new uh, a kind of solidarity. It's not an association, but I think a solidarity initiative. Mm. Uh, it's not a government solidarity initiative, it's just the people of the Arbaker establish it. And also people like me, we are trying to show solidarity with the people who live in the uh, poor areas like in Stur and in Valar. For example, we will distribute uh, 50 packages tomorrow in one of the districts of Sur. Then, you know, next week we will try to distribute 50 more, 50 more. So we are, we are trying to increase the solidarity between the people here, you know, but, you know, we are not so much people, <laughs> a few people now. What, you know, what? Another story, uh, just another uh, result of the last years, you know, all this war, you know, curfews, you know, many people also left the region. You know, it is really so hard now today in the region to find people who can organize these things, you know, people left the region, people left the country. Today, even if I want to have a coffee with one of my friends, to be honest, most of my friends, they are outside the country or they are in prison. It is, it is hard today to live mm -hmm. in. Okay. You, speaking of your journalism again, you're far from the only journalist who has been detained or faced criminal charges for coronavirus coverage. Hakan Aygun was detained just last week for making fun of Erdogan's coronavirus fundraising initiative and Reporters Without Borders said at least eight Turkish journalists are now waiting to learn, like you, waiting to learn whether they will face charges. Yeah. Speaking broadly, what do you think of the government's response to coronavirus thus far? What, what do people think about it in in the southeast, in Diyarbakir, uh, and its continued efforts to silence any criticism about its pandemic response? To be honest, uh, David, openly people say that they can't talk. They can't talk, you know? Mm. Mm. Uh, today, I again uh, called one, some of my uh, friends who are doctors, okay, and try to take some information. They openly said, Nurjan, we can't talk. And today, in, you know, in the last eight years, you know, I, I never stopped, even at, on holidays, I continued to write, sometimes three or four times during the war, you know, during the clashes, three or four times in a week. But today, I'm thinking maybe I need to stop. You know, we can't, we really, we can't, you know. We, ha we have a, this kind of pressure on us. It, in all over the Turkey, we have this pressure, but the pressure here is more, how can I say, it is, it is a bit more uh, worse, the pressure here. Because, uh, for example, when I had a home rate uh, uh, six months ago, I was in London. Mm -hmm. And six months passed, I don't even have one piece of paper. Even the, even the prosecutor says that he, he don't know. He, do, he, do, he doesn't know who did the home raid. Think about 40 people with masks, Kalashnikovs. They are mm. coming to your home. They are taking your children from, the, from their hair while they are sleeping. 
and they are putting them on the ground, you know, and uh, they are just damaging the house. And no one knows who sent them, you know, uh, you know, we also have this kind of behavior here. Everywhere in Turkey is, is so bad now. But again, you know, it is so hard to show uh, this kind of behavior to someone in Istanbul. Because without a warrant, they are coming to your house and think about if I would be at home that day, they would take me and who knows who take me? Because there is not any paper, David. Mm. Yeah, you wrote that. Really yeah. illegal. Everything is so illegal. There is no law here. You wrote last month about reporting on Seljuk uh, Mizrakli's trial and sentencing to more than nine years in prison. His lawyer, I mean Akhtar, described the verdict as a message to Kurdish people that they cannot elect their own mayors. You yeah. wrote then about coming home afterward to find out that Osman Kavala had been acquitted on the Gezi protest charges, then quickly rearrested on failed coup charges. I was going to say, you know, this must be, must have been a dark day for democracy in Turkey for you, but it sounds like this just kind of every day. Yeah, every day. I we all I I really I really feel so tired, and people here we all feel so tired, you know. And every year we are think, we are telling to ourselves that ourselves that this will pass, but it's not passing, you know. For you know, I'm really hopeless for, uh, this time. I'm I'm really hopeless, you know. I don't see a light because if then the war continues, you know, it's every we have lots of problems in Turkey, but most all these problems come to a point is about all about the Kurdish issue. When you continue this war, you know, we, we, will, we will always have these problems, you know, and sometimes they are taking us to prison because of we say uh, peace, we demand peace. For example, two years ago, I, they took me in prison because of demanding peace, but this year, they came, they did the home raid because of, I said, war to war, you know, everything. <laughs> so everything comes to the Kurdish question mm -hmm. and it can't solve the Kurdish question. You know, if today the government cannot uh, really responding to the coronavirus pandemic very in a strong way, because it is mainly because of economy and why our economy is in this position because of, again, because of we are coming to the Kurdish issue. Because why even in the last two, three weeks, okay, the the jets are flying from the Arbaker, you know. When you look the war, you know, we, we, you look the cost of the war, you know, it, it, you know, we can understand why we have this kind of economy. People are not talk, and we can't talk about this. If we if we really look the budget of the Turkey, we will see how how much cost the war to Turkish, you know, to this country, but people are not talking about the war. So well, yeah, like, so thanks, to, thanks to a tweet from a, from an opposition politician this week, we learned that construction on Erdogan's new palace in Bitlis province is still going ahead, even as the government struggles to, as you say, find the funds to deal with the corona crisis. Many have been expecting uh, Erdogan, Turkey, to go full authoritarian during the corona outbreak to do something like what Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban did last week, essentially eliminating parliament so he could rule by decree. Are you expecting Turkey to get darker and more authoritarian in the days and months ahead to, to Erdogan, for, for Erdogan to take a step like this? You know, I think Turkey really in, 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 in darkness for, a, you know, uh, for in the last four or five years. I don't know how dark it can be. It can be more, you know. Uh, but the thing, it seems that everything is, uh, all the decisions are now taken just only by one person, Erdogan. And because uh, it was like uh, last month, I uh, I don't remember where, but I listened one of the interviews of the Ministry of Health. And he was really good in the interview, but we, don't, we didn't have that at that time, any uh, affected person in Turkey from coronavirus. And, but we, we were most watching the other countries. And he said that that's so good that they, you know, just close the cities and all these things, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that, okay, when this pandemic came to Turkey, they know what they will do. Because it seems that the Ministry of Health, he knows, you know, uh, what Turkey should do. But then the, the pandemic came to Turkey and those men, the same men who talked like this in an interview, now he, he couldn't do it. You know, it seems that all these decisions are taken by the 
one person. This is uh, what I see now. Well, this sounds a lot like my country, actually. It sounds like Trump in the U.S. and that his doctors and advisors are telling him to do one thing and he doesn't want to do it. It's much like Erdogan, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, returning it to the piece that Selçuk Mizraklı wrote for Aval, he went on to detail, who, by the way, is a doctor. Uh, he went on to detail how he and his fellow inmates have been doing their best to prevent transmission in prison using some cleaning products they bought from the commissary and like urging his inmates to protect themselves. And his Diyarbakir co-mayor, Gutan Kishanak, who is also in prison, uh, told her daughter in a recent phone call that she and other pri- she and other prisoners had not been given hygiene products or sanitizers and that there were mice everywhere. This does not sound like a clean, healthy environment. So do you expect to see some of these political prisoners die during this pandemic? And, and if that happened, how do you think Kurdish people and Turkish citizens would respond? I really, I hope not. I hope not. But the thing is that, you know, uh, Especially in my article, which uh, in, interrogated by the prosecutor, it was the article which I wrote about the, the situation uh, in the Arbuckle prison. Because at that time, I would talk with one of the family, and uh, who, uh, her uh, husband was in prison, in the Arbuckle prison, and her husband said her that they don't have any hygienic, uh, you know, any anything for uh, the, that they can protect themselves from the coronavirus. So it seems that inside the prisons, everything is so bad. Also, you know, two days ago, we have, uh, there's, uh, there were some problems, up, like an uprising in Batman prison. And at that time, two days, it was the first time, uh, David, in my life, I couldn't write. Because the families called me, and they were so scared that what will, be, what will happen to their loved ones who are in prison. And they told me to write about it, and in my it is in my first uh, first time in my life I couldn't write, and I I felt so bad really, and uh, they were and we still don't know what happened because uh, on the news it said that all those prisoners they sent those prisoners to the Arbuckle prison, and before this pandemic we know that in the in the prisons uh, in one bed sometimes three. Not I'm not talking about two people. Sometimes three people uh, should they need to write, uh, they need to sleep in one bed. So these are because the uh, prisons are overcrowded and overcrowded that they don't have all these you know hygienic things or all this uh, all these tools. So I really don't know what will happen in prisons. And it seems that they will not uh, uh, leave the political prisoners. So I hope nothing will happen to anyone. But you know, it, it, did you say it seems like they? It seems like they will not leave them there. Did you say? I don't think that they will leave them. I don't think that they will because now I think the law is is passing this this week from the from the parliament, and and they are excluding all pr- political prisoners. Yeah. Right, they will leave them in prison. I thought you were saying they would release them. Okay, yeah. Yeah. They yeah. will be they will be left in prison. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah they- yeah, we're we're painting a rather dark picture here of what's happening in Turkey, in Diyarbakir, in these prisons with these political prisoners. And you said before that you feel like you kind of have a protective shield because of your links to international organizations and human rights and advocacy work. Do you then feel because of that, because of this situation and your connections, uh, do you feel kind of a greater responsibility to report on what's happening now because so many Turkish journalists can't really do that right now? Yeah. I feel, I feel responsibility to report, to inform the people about what's happening here. But from other side, David, it is so it is really it is really not easy because from other side, I live with two kids and they need me and I don't want to be in prison when there's this coronavirus pandemic. You know, so it is. But still, I'm trying to report in English, I hope. The Turkish <laughs> government is not <laughs> following my English articles. <laughs> or maybe listening to this podcast. Yeah, listening to this podcast. I, I'm sure the uh, they are, uh, anti-terror police, they are not listening to this English podcast. Uh, and because of, uh, I, I continue to, uh, to write in English and try to talk uh, to outside, but not in Turkish during this time. I will try to stop writing Turkish articles. Maybe one month, we will see. 
just mm. to protect, as as I said, because uh, of the kids, and it seems that because because they interrogate me from very simple things, it seems that they try to take me. Uh, because as I said to you, the prosecutor told me that your voice is so powerful. So this is also a message to me, you know. <laughs> but that's interesting. But that's interesting. You already wrote a piece since you were detained, but now you're saying you're going to stop. Oh, in Turkish, you're going to stop writing in Turkish. I see. No, no, in Turkey. In Turkish, maybe it will be more harder for me in the next uh, maybe one month. You know. Oh, I see. But okay. yeah, in English, I'm. I'm. Tr I will try to write to continue to write in English for a few months. Then we will see what will happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, best of luck to you. Nurjan Baisal, uh, director-based journalist and Aval columnist, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You can follow Ahwal News Online podcast series through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Spreaker. All you need to know about Turkey is here for your ears, mind, and attention. Thank you for listening to our podcast.